I paint houses, inside and out, in Billings, Montana. I just finished eight hours painting a house off Maple Street. Stop at the Painters Union Hall, and Bob tells us that last night some assholes spray painted a bunch of hate-filled graffiti on the house of Eve Running Fox, who happens to be an Indian woman. They painted Die Indian and the Nazi symbol on the outside of her house. Look, I'm no liberal, but it pissed me off. Some innocent woman who happens to be an Indian lives with her kids in Billings, Montana. She wakes up one morning and finds this mean-spirited filth on the outside of her house. So Bob says, will you guys go over to our house and paint it up right? So me and 29 guys, 29 guys who just like me, just finished our regular shifts. We pile into our vans like a convoy and we do what we do. We show up at our house, we set up our ladders, we scrape, we prime, and we paint. When it looks good, we have a beer, and then maybe another. Look, I'm just doing what's right. If some skinhead is going to slink around in the night painting hate on this innocent woman's house while she and her children are asleep inside, then I'm going to show up while they're awake and paint over it. And that's exactly what me and my buddies did. Look, the nutcases who spray painted this innocent woman's house want to clean up the Northwest. You know what it means to clean up? They want to make the Northwest into a place where only white people live. And do you know what white people means? Indians aren't white. Black people and Hispanics aren't white. Jews aren't white. Hell, I'm not sure whether they consider Catholics white. These people are crazy. And they're dangerous. They put on their Nazi uniforms, and their clan hoods. They cover themselves in tattoos. They get their assault weapons, and explosives, and baseball bats. And they kill people. They scare me. Enough talking. Time for another beer. My kids and I wake up this morning and when we go outside and wait for the school bus, we see the words Die Indian painted on the wall of our little house. There's a swastika painted on the house. When we went to bed last night, this was not on the walls. During the night, Somebody was just on the other side of a thin wall when me and my kids were asleep and painted this on our home. What do my kids know? They don't know what a swastika is or what it means. But my older one can read. And his sister asks him, what does it say? And he tells her that it says, die Indian. They know they're Native Americans, members of the proud Absoluque, what the whites call the Crow tribe, and that some people call us Indians. And now, they know that somebody wants them to die. They're just little kids, what do they understand? I can tell you that they feel fear. Now, they don't feel safe in their own home. That's because they were not safe in their home last night. Their mother couldn't protect them from this. This happened when we were asleep inside our house. It was just a thin wall between me and my kids and whoever painted this. Maybe it makes my kids strong. I hope so. I hope so. But it's certainly not what I want my kids to live with. We know in our bones, in our genes, and in our souls that Native Americans are not safe here. Most of our people were killed. A few of us survived, but we're not safe. We're not safe. But that is not the end of the story. Here's what happened today. 30 union painters show up at my house and they paint it. They just showed up and painted over the hate. And my kids see these men, most of them were white men. They're, they did their jobs, I tried to thank them. One of them said to me, 
We're sorry this happened to you, ma'am. We're just doing what's right. No need to thank us. And he meant it. He didn't need to be thanked. I have gratitude in my heart for these men who are just doing what's right. But I'm still scared. My kids are still scared. I don't know if it's helpful, but the feeling is right here. We know we're a target. We know that they know where we live. If they spray painted our house once, they can do it again. If they murdered our brothers and sisters, mothers and fathers, grandmothers and grandfathers, they can murder us. But at the same time, I know that these 30 men are awake too with their paintbrushes and rollers and scrapers and ladders. And they'll make it right. I'm not alone. I've got 30 painting brothers watching my back. A few weeks ago, 19 headstones in the small Jewish cemetery in Billings were turned over. The Catholic cemetery is right next to the Jewish one. There's just a four foot tall chain link fence separating the two cemeteries. Not one headstone at the Catholic cemetery was touched. It was pretty darn clear that this was a hate crime directed at the Jews, but the congregation did not want to make waves, didn't want to draw attention to this incident or us. So the headstone desecrations were called vandalism. Vandalism? How could it be vandalism when it was the headstones at the Jewish cemetery that were knocked down and none were touched at the Catholic cemetery? And then the next week, outside our synagogue, there's a flyer that suddenly appears on the back of a stop sign. The flyer says, Nuke Israel. Someone puts up a Nuke Israel sign right next to the synagogue. We know there are skinheads and neo-Nazis out there. They have a plan, but it's directed at graves and glued to stop signs. It was personal, but not that personal. Until tonight. Tonight, someone throws this brick through Isaac's window, through my five-year-old son's window. This brick that lands with broken glass on my five-year-old son's bed now it's very personal. And for the first time in my life, I feel very cold. I, I've been cold before, but this is a different kind of cold. Now I understand Brian's confession. He wasn't ashamed. He was warning me. I was never scared to be Lutheran. I was never scared to be white. But now I understand. There are people out there in the dark, throwing bricks through the window of my five-year-old son's room because my son is a Jew, because I am a Jew. Brian calls the police. An officer comes to our house. We tell him what happened. He checks the other rooms. He, he's very professional. Looks at the broken window, looks at the brick, he takes notes and calls headquarters and requests for another officer to cruise the neighborhood. The second officer comes to our home and reports that he hasn't seen anyone or anything suspicious, but that they'll keep an eye on the block tonight. They're about to leave and the first officer turns to me and Brian and he says, it might be better if you took the menorah down. I know he's doing his job. He's telling us what he thinks will make it safe for us I am scared. And I've got chutzpah. You don't have to be born Jewish or even be Jewish to have chutzpah. Chutzpah is facing your fear and doing what's right. We know that whoever threw this brick through our son's window is still out there. Yes, I'm scared. And yes, I've got chutzpah. So first thing tomorrow morning, I'm gonna call Gary Svee, an editor at the Billings Gazette, and get the story in the newspaper. And, and the menorah stays in the window. Within a few days, there were menorahs in 5,000 homes in Billings, Montana. Billings has a population of 81,000 people. 
100 of them are Jews. You do the math. It's not just numbers. It was individual human beings who happened to live in Billings, Montana, who placed a menorah in the windows of their homes, businesses, schools, and churches. Each one made a decision to place a Jewish symbol in their window. It wasn't just 5,000 anonymous homes that put menorahs in their windows. It was individual human beings. Putting up menorahs was not without risk. Rocks were thrown through the windows of six homes of non-Jewish families who displayed menorahs. The windows of homes of two other Christian families who displayed menorahs were shot by air rifles. Billings Central Catholic High School posted a sign outside of their building. It read, Happy Hanukkah to our Jewish friends. A brick and two rounds of gunfire were shot at the school. Some folks who had menorahs in their windows got telephone calls. The caller said, go take a look at your car, Jew lover. They went outside and found the windows of their cars broken by rocks. And an arrow killed a cat that belonged to a family who displayed a menorah. It was dangerous to place a menorah in the window. And very quickly, people approached me. Wayne Inman, Billings, Montana, Chief of Police. People were scared. They asked me, is it dangerous to put up menorahs? Well, I'm the Chief of Police. It's my job to, to protect people and property. My job is about public safety. So when people, come, people I'm supposed to protect ask me, if a certain activity is dangerous, well, my answer carries weight. It carries responsibility. That's my job. And I thought about what is the right answer. I say to them, yes, it is dangerous to put a menorah in your window. But I'll tell you, I think it's more dangerous not to put a menorah in your window. If we go quietly, then the haters will have free reign. Maybe some innocent people are going to be hurt. But the truth is, innocent people have already been hurt. And I believe if we don't hang in menorahs in our windows, more innocent people will be hurt than if we crawl into our little cocoons and crawl away and die. To tell you the truth, I haven't been sleeping very well. I told people to do something that really is quite dangerous. I can live with that. Sometimes you've got to take the risk if it means doing the right thing. As I say these last words, three skinheads walk in the door of my church. They wear heavy black boots. They have a swastika tattooed on their forearms. They stand in a line, cross their arms, and they sneer. I see them. My congregation sees them. I take a breath. And then I continue to preach. Our church is a place of caring for those who are weak, for those who are ill, for those who are hungry, for those who are scared, and for those who are filled with hatred. Yes, we have a heart for all of those in need. We will give you a blanket if you're cold. We will give you a hearty soup if you're hungry, we will visit you in your hospital bed. And yes, we will love you even if you come to us in hate. We do not need a mega church. In fact, we do not even need our small building with our simple pews and this simple preacher. We usually don't see white people here at Wayman Chapel, certainly not three skinheads. I look for it, but I cannot find a trace of heart in these angry young white men. My church is a small building, so these angry white men, these men filled with hate, take up a lot of space. Their silence takes up a lot of space. I continue my sermon. Brothers and sisters, recall from the book of Samuel, the small boy who faced a giant. That small boy asked God for help. That small boy was 
small in size. And that giant was a giant in size. But that size doesn't matter. Even if that evil was large because righteousness does not need a big man. Righteousness does not need a big gun. In fact, that small boy who, whose name was David only needed a small stone and a means to deliver it. A humble, small stone propelled by the power of God brought down Goliath. And that small boy, David, was left standing he was standing to do God's will. He was standing to do God's work, to feed the hungry, to comfort the sick, to warm our brothers and sisters who are cold. No, I do not need a mega church. I only need God's will and God's love. My congregants are looking at me, but glance nervously over their shoulders at the skinheads. The skinheads stare straight ahead. My job is to lead my congregation, and I'll be damned if I don't do my job. It is Sunday service, and we will praise God. We will thank God. We will dedicate our lives to the service of the gospel. I will not allow these bullies to bully me or my congregation or my Sunday service. <laughs> 